This is lecture one of the Necromancy of Nyarlathotep by uh, Giuseppe Balsamo. It's Disclosure from the Necronomicon Fragment, Volume 1. And it's sort of a overview. So this book is very much partnered with uh, two works, namely of August Moldenhauer, that being The Genealogy of Cthulhu, Volume 1 of Catu Journals Out of Lovecraft's Providence, and also The Psychoanalysis of Rilier, Volume 2 of the same series. So in our section, the ontologies of Lovecraft's Nyarlathotep, it was a dream of Lovecraft's, and he penned the dream while he was half asleep. So it kind of came out of those origins that maybe we will begin lecture one, just thinking of the ontologies of Lovecraft's uh, Nyarlathotep. Maybe we'll go to the main text itself. Nyarlathotep. Uh, Dream by H.P. Lovecraft. He calls him a quasi-Egyptian god. So let's say in a way that this is where... Um, the dream comes into Lovecraft's consciousness, we'll say, right? And as the story goes, he uh, describes Nyarlathotep as he appears in the modern times. Uh, and again, it's inspired by Nikola Tesla as kind of a circus performer an itinerant showman or lecturer, he says in his uh, selected letters. But then he also has this kind of dream of him, what Lovecraft calls from the race of the pharaohs. And yet, when we look at this with the rest of Lovecraft's lore, uh, I can't help to think of that there's a, a connection here between forgotten history or lost history, right? So the idea of um, Nyarlathotep coming out of Egypt, who he was, none could tell, but he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. And he arose out of the blackness of 27 centuries. And yet he's something far more ancient, right? So he's far more ancient than this. So now when we're talking about the ontologies of Nyarlathotep, we have the first layer of that is Lovecraft's dream. And then it forms itself as this Nikola Tesla doppelganger. So what does Tesla bring? He bring, it brings the static electricity and the, and the strange um, uh, showmanship that he has, right? Where, where Lovecraft calls him out as a, you know, you have to go and see him uh, his power, his instruments of glass and metal. Speaking of the sciences of electricity and psychology, just, you know, again, these are just Lovecraftian tropes almost, right? But there's something there. And then behind this, behind all of this, suddenly we have that final paragraph where there's the uh, only the gods can tell from where. And how Nyarlathotep, whatever he is at his core, be, before the pharaohs, um, beyond the world's vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples on nameless rocks beneath space. So now again, now here we're, here we're getting somewhere, right? And this is where the resonance to Moldenhauer's works comes in. Moldenhauer has the series of translations that will talk about 
Cthulhu sleeping and the death dreaming, right? And this is where this necromancy, necromancy confusion comes in. Because again, we're already getting the tones here of something beyond time, the, the pounding of the drums, the piping, slow, awkward, gigantic, tenebrous gods, the blind, voiceless, mindless gargoyles whose soul is Nyarlathotep, right? So here in those ontologies, we have to look at the concept of what are these places, right? What are these places of, you know, you know, it's almost mythic Egypt. It's not the real Egypt. It's sort of the mythological Egypt, right? As the weird hermetic, right? Even the hermetic texts are mistakenly uh, considered to be of ancient Egypt. So I think this confusion of the dating of things ties into this ontology because it's so far ancient and maybe predates the earth, right? So the idea here of Nyarlathotep's ontologies takes us back, and this is where the metaphors of the Necronomicon come in, right? The Necronomicon comes in, and you have the idea of maybe a gateway back to Lemuria, a gateway back to Atlantis, but then beyond Nephrim Ka, like how does Nephrim Ka fit into this, the pharaoh Nephrim Ka? The spatial temples around him, and I even think of the um, the idea of the dark pyramid, right? The dark pyramid built upon the souls, and then Yarlethotep's strange electricity, the resonance device of the pyramid, as Atlantean technology. But then Atlantis also starts to seem now like a uh, a weird mythic name drop that's a placeholder for something that's even deeper, right? And this is where you get into the Lovecraftian cosmic horror, the, the, the vastness of it, right? So the idea is we go from the Tesla electricity, jump right back to the pharaonic Egypt with the dark pyramid, the resonance pyramid, what are those devices? Then we jump back another level to Atlantis, jump back another level to Lemuria, and then back through to... Um, Nyarlathotep's origins, you know, and this are kind of like where we start to rub up against the idea of uh, Alhazred's Necronomicon. There is that sense of um, the name when we talk about the Mad Arab, while we're talking about the Mad Arab, got Crowley's Ether. And in Rillier, roiling has a sound of roiling, Rillier. Roiling as in boiling. Or, yes, ra'al ya. And then there's also the idea of mankind, shaitan, is kadhulu, meaning forsaken from the uh, Arabic. So it's the forsaker or the forsaken, right? Cthulhu. And this is where that it's kind of love, it's kind of Cthulian dream magic. But if we go back to the neck to the Nyarlathotopian gateway, let's call it, like where does that lead back to? And this is where we're really past the ability to reconcile it with, you know, uh, traditional history. And that's why he's a crawling chaos, right? Nyarlathotep is kind of a messenger who can live past the ages. And he also has a chaotic nature to his uh, revealing of uh, gnosis, let's call it. Right? So if we think of him as also as a Saturn figure, that will help us out a lot, I believe, ontologically. So, yes, yeah, so... Um, there is the idea of Nyarlathotep as an avatar in human form, right? So some of the things here makes him similar to uh, witches or the vampire, 
right? He takes this form, but it's not his true form, right? Sort of, sort of when we think of the vampire ability to shape shift in a way. Uh, and then that the ability for him to somehow perhaps access the greater gods, you know, so something about crawling chaos and his knowing of Azathoth, his knowing of uh, Yogg-Sothoth, his knowing of Cthulhu, right? These are kind of, uh, and where Cthulhu is represented priestly, Nyarlathotep is kind of identified as the black pharaoh. Right, so that makes him Saturnian. Right, and then we have to think of the cycle of the time of where his Saturnian um, Sabbath would, would, would lay with. So if we think of the uh, concepts from the idea of Saturn, then the origin of Saturn is before the gods, which is before the earth, before the water, before the sky. Right, so Saturn in this way is time. So yeah, so there may be a Saturnian aspect to Nyarlathotep that ties into this ontological um, discovery of him. And there's also a chaos, because he's crawling chaos. Again, in the, let's call it in the... Um, in the theogony, the tradition of the theogony, you know, Saturn relating to the primordial chaos and a direct child of Saturn, right? So there's that Saturnian nature of blackness represented in Nyarlathotep. There's the Saturnian nature of time He's timeless. He's from ancient times, so he stretches across time. Uh, and there's this uh, Saturnian nature of chaos. And there's also this kind of a technology that he brings, right? So he brings the technology of the, um, the, s the cycle, let's call it, you know, the sunrise and sunset cycle, right? The chaos. Uh, that is constant in a universe of change, right? The Saturnine deity also is depicted as black, right? Because chaos is also black. It's uh, not able to be... Um, the light of order cannot shine upon it. And then the only reason why it's considered malevolent is because of its ability to uh, disassociate from life. And there's sort of a... The, the leaking nature of the crawling chaos. It's sort of the trick of the immortal... Um, human guised Nyarlathotep to outlive the cycle of birth and death. And this is really related to necromancy, right? It's another kind of necromantic art. So I think the uh, necromantic arts traditionally are looked at as speaking to the dead, raising the dead, and maybe some demonology you know, the, the raising of the uh, disembodied demons, which for all, purpose, all intents and purposes are not alive, right? So I think that this, eve, e, this opening, you know, they talk about the blasphemous flutes from the unconceivable and the maddening beating of drums and the wine, the monotonous wine of time, beyond time, shadow writhing in hands, Lovecraft says, right? So again, there's a sovereignty to him. He's, a, he's the pharaoh, right? He's the black pharaoh. Um, he, and, and of course, Egypt reminds us of the pyramid. But again, the pyramid is related to the black cube of Saturn, right? So there's that as well. Um, so there is a, a definitely a uh, 
a kind of Nyarlathotepian order uh, that's at play here. I do want to take a better look at the Black Pharaoh uh, as a closeout. So the Black Pharaoh, they're talking about the astral Sabbath, an astral Sabbath, meaning there's a Sabbath in the... Uh, okay, so we have our cycles here on Earth. You know, we have, uh, let's take them the simplest, waking and sleep, wake, waking and sleeping, which is day and night. And then we have aging, which is the year. We have the fertility cycle, which is the moon cycle, right? Uh, the cycle of fertility, the cycles of the year and the seasons, which are also fertility, seasons of fertility, you know, um, planting, growing, um, harvesting, reaping, and then lay fallow and then starting over again, right? So those cycles are time cycles. And that's that fecundity of the soil. Uh, everything comes from the, the black soil. Uh, the night is the black to the day's light and that cycle goes out greater when we think of say a saturnian cycle the planet saturn going around the sun once every 29 years somewhat marking uh human events of you know being 30 years old or 60 years old sort of a human lifetime the three ages of the the woman as a um as a virgin as a uh, mother and as the crone, something like this, the three ages, the, no, the, the Norns, we could call them even, right? Uh, so there is that aspect to it. But then when we're talking about the astral Sabbath, it's another kind of time cycle. Maybe that's not linear, a chaotic time cycle. So it's more a, a, an energetic state where we move into the Sabbath mode and we move out of the Sabbath mode. And that crawling chaos, maybe there's not a pattern to it. Uh, which makes it disturbing to think about. And this is where Saturn comes into rule, right? In the darkness, he can flatten out that astral Sabbath. Um, and this is probably key to, I'd say, pre-Atlantean, pre-Lemurian energetic states uh, that, I, that probably are as distant from us. I mean, if you think of it this way, the Hermeticists, the Medici translators of the Hermetic texts, the Corpus Hermeticum, thought of Egypt. The Egy Egyptians carried on the tra traditions of Atlantis. The Atlanteans forgot much of Lemuria, right? And if we keep going back to this story, we can kind of say that this whole time, Nyarlathotep was walking across the ages, right? So Nyarlathotep kind of seems to be a thread through all that. And there's a sort of a freedom to that, right? There's a freedom to it, uh, and there's a deliriousness to it, right? You know, finally, uh, Lovecraft says, a sick and sensitive shadow writhing in hands that are not hands and whirled blindly past ghostly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low, beyond the world's vague ghosts of monstrous thing, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up dizzy vacua, above the spheres of light and darkness. So here now we are saying with the beat of the maddening drums, he's actually beyond light and darkness. And this may be a kind of darkness that's akin to the astrological uh, interpretations of Uranus, the planet Uranus, as the sun behind the sun. It's kind of a cosmic sun or a higher dimensional sun. If there is a higher dimensional sun, there is also a darkness that's beneath light and dark you know it's the monopole of light and dark so th this kind of darkness is very much key to the saturnian um so the saturnian cube let's call it and the in in by nature 
Nyarlathotep's crawling chaos or his cult of crawling chaos, right? So I think that here in the here, like to wrap up these ontologies, we see that uh, Nyarlathotep crosses through the time notion. He crosses through the cycles of the world, and he he backdates through the misinterpretations. You know, the hermetic misinterpretation of Egypt, the Egyptian misinterpretation of Atlantis, the Atlantis mi misinterpretation of Lemuria. And then goes all the way back to, you know, perhaps by, by nature of chains, to the black stone, to the black cube, right? And this is the sort of a, a Saturnian mystery. So I, I guess that this... Uh, leads us to kind of a Lovecraftian sigil that Nyarlathotep represents that Lovecraft just kind of stum stumbled across. I mean, as one drawn into gazing into the fear and as one uh, having that bubble up in his dream and even speak it as a name, we can kind of see him as a reluctant um, remote viewer of such things. So yeah, so I think that this is, you know, so as we go into the next lecture, we'll talk a bit more about um, not only the manifestations of Nyarlathotep in relation to necromancy, but we'll talk a bit about the uh, how the Necronomicon fragments in the Katu journals uh, speak to this... Um, cult of Nyarlathotep's crawling chaos and how they are related to the sleeping and waking of Cthulhu and that confusion between sleep and death that, um, that are key to understanding Nyarlathotep's reign.